Good morning, everyone. Uh, so usually the most anticipated ultrasound in a pregnancy is a 20-week ultrasound. That's the one where you get to find out the gender of the baby. So with already four boys at home, we were pleasantly surprised that when we learned that the baby I was carrying was gonna be a girl. It had been a difficult pregnancy with severe morning sickness. So I couldn't eat anything, I couldn't stand the smell of anything. I was in and out of the hospital getting the occasional IV when the morning sickness was excessive. At 20 weeks, things were finally getting better. I was managing the morning sickness a lot better. I was starting to have energy again. And four days after my ultrasound, I prepared to go to my routine OB appointment. I was in the car on my way to her office when I got a call from my OB. Over my Bluetooth speaker, I was told that I had to turn my car around immediately and head to Sunnybrook Hospital. That they were able to squeeze me in for an emergency appointment. I asked exactly what was going on. She told me that there was an abnormality in the shape of my baby's head. I was terrified. I bawled in the car and somehow navigated my way to Sunnybrook Hospital. I remember I really wanted to call my husband, but he was at work and I didn't want to disturb him, so I went by myself. I told myself to be strong and I prayed for her. Two more ultrasounds um, at that appointment after the doctor took me aside to another room and sat me down. He broke the news to me and told me that my baby girl had spina bifida. Spina bifida? I had no clue what spina bifida was. It must have something to do with the spine. He explained to me that her spine had not closed properly and it was sticking out of her back. Her nerves were exposed, getting more and more damaged as the pregnancy progressed. He explained that she would need surgery shortly after she was born to repair her back possible brain surgery, foot surgery, and leg surgery. The words paralysis, brain damage, and clubbed feet hit me hard. I asked, what do you mean by paralysis and brain damage? Like, how paralyzed and what is the effect of the brain damage? How severe is this? What functions would it affect? Both were questions that he could not confidently answer for me at that moment. But he did refer me to speak with Dr. Church and Dr. Drake at SickKids and have my questions professionally answered by someone who knew the condition better. Unfortunately, that appointment would not come for a week later. I was told that if I decided to terminate my pregnancy, that I would need to decide within the next few weeks. First, the hard news, now an option that I had never considered before. So we just signed some papers and that's the end of it all. I just, I still feel her moving and kicking inside of me. He told me that he would give me some space so I have some time to absorb the news and call whomever I wanted. Before he left, I asked him one more question. How did I do this to my daughter? What did I do wrong? Is this my fault? What, what did I do? I wrecked my brain trying to figure out where I went wrong, how I failed my little girl, trying to find my mistake and feeling like the worst mother in the world. He was kind and he assured me it wasn't my fault. I wasn't sure completely that I believed him at that point, but he left the room to give me space. I called some family members and asked, finally worked up the courage to ask my husband to meet me at the hospital. And he came as soon as we could. We drove home together in silence, both in shock. We got home and I told my parents who were wondering what had happened. It was the hardest day of my life. We were devastated. I buried myself under the covers and cried. The excitement of a pink room attending ballet recitals and dance classes quickly dissipated. It was replaced with fear of all the surgery she was gonna need, all the pain that she would be in the recovery time in the hospital, all the therapy she would, uh, she would need. I had some people close by, cl close to me, that um, tell me that if they were in my shoes, they would have chosen to abort the baby. I prayed really hard, harder than any other time I've prayed in my life. And I said, dear God, I have a very diff difficult decision to make. 
I've weighed my options, and both options my kids lose. If I keep this baby, she will require so much of our attention. I won't be able to balance our life with our four other boys. If my husband and I pass away early, they will have to be her caregiver for the rest of their lives. They might not be able to live where they want to, work where they want to, or have the family life that they want to because they'll have the responsibility to care for her sister. If they gave up and stopped caring for her, she'll be stuck in a nursing home with no one to love her. What if I make that decision? How can I make that decision that will affect their future when so much, um, their future so much when they're so young? On the other hand, if I decide to terminate the pregnancy, everything remains the same, except I lose my daughter. She's still kicking me. It's not like she's dead. She's still moving. How could I do that to her? Why do I have to choose between my four sons and my unborn daughter? I was so heartbroken. I didn't know what to do anymore. As soon as I finished my prayer, the thought entered my mind. Do as I say, and I will take care of the rest. Do as I say and take care of the rest? If I do as he says, it means I'm keeping my daughter, and he'll take care of the rest. Suddenly, I sent a sense of calm come over me, and it was that hug that I was longing for at that moment. I was keeping my daughter. I wiped my tears, rolled up my sleeves, and I turned to the internet to learn as much as I could. I looked for her best chance, and I learned about fetal surgery. Doctors could repair her back while I was pregnant and allow her to continue developing in my womb. By repairing her back in utero in the critical stages of fetal development, it better preserved her nerves. A study done in the States comparing the results between postnatal repair and fetal surgery showed that babies who underwent fetal surgery showed higher chances of walking, showed the chances, uh, the, the chances of the need of a shunt decreased by half. So it went from 82% down to 40%. And in many cases, the brain, which was previously pulled down into the neck cavity, moved back into normal position. How wonderful that modern medicine had come this far. While fetal surgery is not a cure, it, was, it had the proven potential to minimize the effects of spina bifida because of the nature of the surgery. The catch was that it wasn't available in Canada, that Canada was still far away from bringing the surgery on home turf. If I wanted to have the surgery for my baby girl, I would have to travel to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. To have the surgery there, and then stay there on bed rest for the remainder of the pregnancy until I give birth. Not so simple with a busy household of four kids, a husband, and work. I decided that I needed to do this for her, that we as a family would sacrifice for the first few months to give her the best chance that she had at a normal life. I met with Dr. Drake and Dr. Ryan and underwent many tests. I told them I wanted to go ahead with the surgery. I had done all my research, and I was ready to go down to the States that I just needed their referral. When I say I did my research, I meant kind of went a little FBI mode, and I Googled a lot more than I should have. So I found everything online, and everything that I found gave me comfort, because I saw how magnificent this team was. And I remember thinking, I wish I had my surgery at Toronto instead, and I wish these doctors were the ones doing my surgery instead. They had my full and complete trust. To my surprise, Dr. Ryan had told me that they were ready to do the first spinal bifida, spina bifida fetal surgery in Canada, where the surgery would be performed at Mount Sinai Hospital in collaboration with SickKids and Vanderbilt Hospital. And they asked me if I would like to be their first patient. My jaw literally dropped on the floor. I could not find it. I said, absolutely. I was so happy. I really tried to restrain myself from hugging him. If I did, I probably would not have let go. Security would have had to pry Dr. Ryan out of my She-Hulk pregnant arms. You know, us pregnant ladies, if you've ever held a pregnant woman's hand and said push at the same time, we have a death grip. <laughs> While I was waiting for surgery, I was fortunate enough to have researched and maybe borderline Facebook stalked a few Canadian spina bifida moms and reached out to them to ask some questions. At the time, I had more questions for the moms and families living with spina bifida than I had for the doctors. 
They were so unbelievably kind and accommodating and they answered my questions and one of them actually introduced me to a group of spina bifida moms who had undergone fetal surgery at, uh, on Facebook. So I was lucky enough to be bombarded with blogs, pictures, videos of their young ones doing well. I saw announcements of babies being born. I saw ones of babies passing. I saw posts where babies were being admitted into the hospital, having surgery, photos of their first steps, dance recitals, sports games, graduations, prom, and I was inspired and thankful. After an MRI, amniocentesis, and several ultrasounds later, June 4th, surgery day came, 25 weeks gest gestation. The magical team of 24 medical staff from three hospitals, including our very own Dr. Kulkarni, was there. I was rolled in, not scared, but so incredibly grateful for all the wonderful people in that room. Are you guys ready to see what it looked like? Okay, so they've already cut my belly at this point, and this is my uterus. They're checking for the ultrasound, um, just to make sure that they've, they're cutting into the right location. And that's my uterus. They're clamping it down so I don't bleed. And um, so that's a lot of hands in there at that tiny space. Anyone squeamish yet? <laughs> That's the baby in the middle, that's her back with the lesion, the spina bifida lesion that they're uh, removing and um, they're carefully putting back together. So ICO is, um, there's a term that they use in the spina bifida fetal surgery community. So she's considered twice born. So she was born because technically she, um, they opened her womb at, the, at this time and uh, she was born again when, uh, on her actual birthday. So after the surgery, they, they're closing out all back up again. And that's, uh, that's it. And then they sealed me back up um, to care, continue the pregnancy um, for a couple more months until I gave birth to her at uh, August 19th. So I ended up waking up after surgery four hours later. They told me everything went well. I was rolled off into recovery under the amazing care at Mount Sinai. It was two weeks of recovery at Mount Sinai. Coughing hurt, laughing hurt, standing and walking after surgery was a challenge. Um, I had my staples removed uh, in the second week. Nice little scar there. So they went all the way up. Um, and it, this, the cut was the same um, in my uterus as well. Um, so it, it's still, in the beginning when I coughed, it felt like it was actually pulling away again, but I think it was just my imagination. I was on a lot of drugs at that point. Um, so I was able to go home after the two weeks and continue my pregnancy on bed rest. And uh, I, was, I delivered August 19th, and I finally got to meet my beautiful baby girl. Yay. <laughs> I remember still being scared, and as, as she passed each test, I was able to let go of a little piece of that fear. Her back was healing nicely, she was gaining weight, breathing on her own, she progressed well in NICU. Um, as you can see, she was born breached, so her legs were kind of up in the air saying hi. Um, so her, her brain has moved back into normal position, it's stable, she has not needed further brain surgery so far, there's no shunt and she can stand with support. She's waiting on her first set of AFOs, uh, so braces, so she can start walking. She is a smooth talker and a great dancer. She is a happy and cheerful baby and determined to meet all of her milestones. We've come a long way from moms like Rachel Strong and Beth Trahan who paved the way and fought to have these surgeries only available at US at the time to be approved by OHIP. Imagine having to be faced with this dilemma and not having the funds to cover it. It's upwards of over 140,000 UK, um, US for the surgery alone. Uh, to last year's first spina bifida fetal surgery in Canada, and now we're on our 12th mom and baby this year and announcing the official opening of the Ontario Fetal Center. I'm so proud of the progress that has been made. 
And I didn't need to be the mom who had to make that difficult choice to leave my home, my husband, my kids, and cross the border for my baby, like so many other brave moms before me. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the amazing team at both Mount Sinai and SickKids. And I have an immense sense of gratefulness throughout the entire process, which my family and I will carry in our hearts always. I swear, I must have been their creepiest patient. All the Googling and then looking at them, saying thank you, mid enema, it was not very <laughs> pleasant. I blame the hormones. Um, but I've gained so much perspective writing in the speech, and truly, I've, um, they've given her such an amazing gift, the gift of walking, the gift of less surgeries and less pain, the gift of an outcome that I hadn't imagined was possible on diagnosis day. You will be for forever grateful. November of last year, the surgery was publicly announced and it was announced to the world. Our story was covered by Canada's major news outlets, CBC, CTV, CB24, and even made it to the front page of the Toronto Star. From there, news of ICO surgery spread worldwide from US to Asia, Europe, and Africa. From reading the comments and all the articles, it gave people hope. It highlighted our brilliant and talented medical team at both Mount Sinai and Sick Kids Hospitals. It showed the work of how great our universal healthcare system is in Canada. And it showed the general public that spina bifida can be more than just a diagnosis. It is first and foremost a beautiful child with a beautiful life. In my research, I came across a, a statistic that approximately 68% of babies diagnosed with spina bifida are terminated. I truly believe that the more the people see Ico's story, the greater the awareness we bring around spina bifida, that these numbers will go down. She's barely one year old, she's a little over one years old and already inspiring so many. And every time I look at her now, I know I made the right choice for us and she's my living gift. Throughout this process, I've had family and friends tell me, oh, you're so brave. Over the past year, I definitely felt like the scared one, the overwhelmed one, the tired one, the hormonal one, the emotionally drained and hopeless one. This process has also given, made me into the driven one, the determined one, the thankful and eternally grateful one, the patient one, the stalker one, the trusting and faithful one, and most of all, the one that pushes forward and continues on. In a little over a year, we've gained a whole new family in the spina bifida community, including you guys and our healthcare professionals, and we are so thankful for everyone in it. Um, that's Aiko right now. <laughs> Hunger pains, <laughs> she wants a snack. But um, yeah, she's doing amazing. <laughs>